So welcome everyone to Screenshot. This is week three of a series of virtual artist talks led by Scope of Work. The goal of Screenshot is to highlight how both SO members and veteran creatives are maintaining their creative identities through this global crisis. It's meant to be an intimate window into the artist's work and their creative practice from the privacy of their homes. It happens twice a week, once with a SO member and once with a veteran creative. Um, where the creative will share examples of their work, answer a series of questions, um, and share, share some best practices. Zoom etiquette, just so everyone knows, everyone's been muted on entry so that the presenter can um, go through their talk uninterrupted. If you have questions, you can write them in the chat. Big thanks to everyone who submitted questions over Instagram over the last few days. Angela will be answering those too. Um, and so we are so excited and grateful to Angela Bakke for joining us this week. Angela is the founder and creative director of Awake New York and Bakke Creative. After a decade at Supreme, Angela's work um, inspires and incubates the next wave of creatives here in New York. And he's a native New Yorker from Queens. I'm gonna hand it over to you. Hi. So are you going to be asking me questions? I'm just I can, to... if you yeah, want. I, yeah, but I'd okay. rather do it that so way. Tell us about your path to becoming a creative. <laughs> well, one, my name is Angelo Bakke. Thank you for having me at <laughs> Geneva. In, um, and, and thank you all for showing up, you know, because I'm pretty sure during COVID, you have a whole lot of better things to do at one o'clock in the afternoon. So thank you for taking time out for this, for this talk. Uh, my path to to becoming a creative um, it's kind of like it's fragmented I can't I'm not gonna sit here and say like I had a very early idea that I wanted to be in the creative field um, actually I thought I was gonna be an engineer in, in junior high school um, I was like in all those advanced like AP classes and whatnot and then in high school I decided that I wanted to um, just not, and I just wanted to write graffiti and hang out with my friends and be downtown. Um, and then in, I went to community college and I was convinced I wanted to teach social studies. I wanted to be a social studies teacher. And then I had my own little like revolutionary enlightenment where I realized that all of history that I was being taught was a lie and a farce. So, and I felt really guilty. Uh, you know, how can I teach this history that is not true to, you know, the youth? Um, and then through a bunch of friends that I had hanging out downtown, you know, they stole my first camera and they were like, here, you're going to start taking pictures. Everywhere we go, you're going to take pictures of us. And that was really how I had my, my path into, or I got my way into creativity or becoming a creative, you know, being raised by, you know, an immigrant mom, you know, uh, just the idea of being an artist of being a creative was just, it was not discussed in my, in my house, in my family. You know, my mother had her set idea of what of what and who I should be. And I definitely was not a photographer or graphic designer or, you know, a creative director. You know, it was a, a doctor or a lawyer or some type of civil servant. You know, so that, you know, to get to to get from point A to point B, which was to get on this path of becoming a creative, was wasn't easy. You know, it was about, you know, 20 to 21 years before I finally made that decision and when i told my mother she she literally started crying you know she was like you're going to be a beggar you're going to be a pauper in the street there's no way that you're going to make a living being an artist and um i just said fuck it i'm gonna go for it you know um and i just wanted to decide to go to school of visual arts and you know growing up growing up here in new york city you know I'm, I'm on the assumption that everyone here is a native new yorker you know like we learn how to hustle at an early age you know I, I started working when i was 13 and you know by any means i would try to make sure that i had at least five bucks for mcdonald's in my pocket you know in my teens or you know money for you know money for the train <clears throat> so i took that same kind of ideology hustle mindset into you know wanting to get into any type of like creative realm you know because we we don't have accessibility to that right you know uh what i learned through art history is and specifically photo history was that it was it was photo history was built on the rich right only the rich can travel the world during the great depression of the 30s and you know take pictures of their families and their and their travels like right as when like photography became a thing um so right then and there i realized that this is not fair you know like this whole the way this system is set up it, like if it clicked to me immediately when i went to school of visual arts when it was me 
and literally my one other friend, Rafael Rios, who's Puerto Rican from Brooklyn, we were the only two Browns in all of, in the whole foot, like foot photography program of School of Visual Arts, right? And I was like, yo, we gotta stick together and we're gonna hustle together, you know? And that's, you know, to this day, he's, he's one of my best friends. But yeah, like once my mind was made up that I was gonna be a photographer, there was nothing that you could tell me like that. There was nothing that you could tell me that was going to hold me back. My, my mother, my family, you know, the doors that I got shut in my face, you know, cause I wasn't great. You know, I sucked when I first started taking pictures. So I would take my portfolio to get, you know, a portfolio review at certain magazines. And they were like, yeah, this is not it. <laughs> they were like, yo, this is not it, you know, but I would, you know, I had enough sense and some type of humility where I was able to at least, take the good with the bad you know so even though it was a, a form of rejection it still had it gave me the inspiration like all right well i need to get better you know i'm going to keep taking pictures and i'm going to keep working on my craft and you know really dedicate myself you know i i up until that point i really i, I really took pride in being a d a d student you know like once i realized that d was passing in high school i kind of accepted that as kind of like my lifestyle you know like i'm just going to do just enough to pass you know, like, don't ask me for more. And I'm definitely not going to do any less because less would be failure. So I kind of had, had, I had to like demolish and destroy that kind of like D plus mentality in order to be able to really excel. Because once again, like, whether we know it or not, the, re the reality is that being a Latino, being from Queens, being a native New Yorker, like, I'm not two steps behind. I'm like 10 steps behind in any type of like art world you know I'm, I'm not going to a prestigious school i don't have the friends i don't have the money i don't have uh you know that kind of like pedigree you know which is you know now it's like the playing field is kind of evened out a little bit you know but just to give you guys some type of context like we're talking about like 1996 and some of y'all i'm going to assume weren't even born in 1996 so like 1996 1997 you know late 90s like it was it, we were not popping you know, like hiring POC people, it was not popping. It was not a thing. Like today is kind of the norm. But, you know, like you really have to take into consideration the time and the place and the way things were kind of unfolding. Like the cards were stacked against me. So like I had to like really push forward in order to want this career. Thank you. That's beautiful and very thorough. So talk to us about um, why you started Awake and then how Awake has been maybe affected by the pandemic. So the, the reason I started Awake was um, back to, you know, my early influences in the early 90s, there were a lot of brands that were incorporating social and political messages into their clothing, right? So there's this one brand that I always talk about called Proud Nubian Brothers, PNB. And now what was so revolutionary about PNB at the time is that it was, it, it was founded by three graffiti writers and at that point, no clothing brand had been owned by anyone that had any type of similar interest to me or from New York City or just had this kind of point of view that I had. You know, back then it was Ralph Lauren, Tommy Hilfiger, Nautica. So it was, it was these kind of like aspirational brands, but there wasn't any real connection back to the brands. Like I couldn't see myself like in like within the brand or creating for the brand. Excuse me. And I really loved how they use the t-shirt as a platform to educate. So there's a few t-shirts that, well, graphics I always remember, like they had um, on a sticker, like a hello, my name is sticker, like Eleanor Bumper is Michael Stewart. And I forgot who the third name was, but they were all victims of police brutality. So, you know, this is once again, pre-internet, pre-Google, like I had to go find out who Eleanor Bumpers is. I had to go find out who Michael Stewart was, you know. Uh, Michael Stewart was, you know, was a graffiti writer that was that was killed by police officers here in New York City. You know, he was choked to death um, just for catching a tag. So, you know, I, that that kind of way of that education process and and that even that idea of how to design for the masses, we lost that between that period and now, right? Um, and once again, you know, not to harp on the past, but I'm going to harp on the past. Like in the late 90s and early 2000s, you also had a lot of what was called back then urban, urban gear that was owned by, you know, essentially black and brown people. Uh, Willie Esco, Mecca, Fubu, Aniche, you know, so within those companies, they were also hiring POC. Okay. 
but they weren't carrying that same social political message from the early 90s. So that was kind of lost around that time period. And then you have a lot of the hip hop brands that were birthed through rappers, Shady Wear, uh, G Unit, Rock Aware, right? So and then there was even more of a watering down of, of that messaging. And then you get to the point where we're at now where we're at streetwear. And it's not streetwear's fault that the top brands are owned by basically white men, Supreme, Stussy, Palace, um, you name it, right? So why can't I have my own? And the reason why I started Awake and the reason why I started Bucket Creative is to teach y'all ownership. You know, it's not so much about like being lit and owning, you know, a dope clothing brand and having, you know, making bread, you know, like that's cool. You know, definitely if I, if I didn't make money, I wouldn't be here, right? So like, I'm a capitalist at heart and I'm trying to, I'm trying to build like a, a, like a, a, like a healthy capitalist ecosystem for everyone where like I could teach you how to make money, but at the same time have some type of consciousness while making this money and being, being aware of your community and being aware of your people where if I'm opening up this door, you know, I'm going to make sure that I leave it open for, for Ida. I'm going to leave it open for Geneva and I'm going to teach them game. I'm going to teach them how I got to point B. My predecessors did not teach that to me. You know, our predecessors were really content with getting in the room and then shutting the door because of fear, fear that um, that one competition, that somehow some way that I'll I'll take that money or that budget that's been allocated to them away from them. But, you know, my goal is to empower. That's the whole point of why I, that's the whole point of that. And, I, and I'd be lying to you if I say that that's why I started awake. That's not why I started awake. I wanted, I wanted to start awake because I had my own ideas and I had my own vision that I couldn't, I couldn't execute as Supreme anymore because that's not what Supreme is about. And that's fine. Supreme is what it is. It's skate, it's downtown, it's cool. It's counterculture, rebellious, right? Boom. That's always been, that's been what Supreme is about. Awake is not that, you know, awake is what I'm about. It's about empowerment, youth empowerment, POC, you know, uh, you know, building community, giving back, uh, practicing philanthropy, you know, education. Um, that's why it's, that's why I felt like it was important for me to start awake. It, it morphed into what it is today, you know, three and a half years later, where, um, we are kind of like building this, this, we, we almost, I want to say like, we're the consciousness of streetwear right now. Because now, like, I feel companies are reaching out to me, for example, like StockX, you know, because they want to be community involved, but they, they have, they have the, the smarts to reach out to someone and not, like, go around me or over me to try to make that connection back to community and to do, to do these givebacks. Yeah, that's so dope. And you can see that. I mean, I feel like you're, what you're doing in streetwear is making other people then try to do that in streetwear, you know? Is like giving it a bit of like a soul or a spirit or a consciousness. Um, so, I mean, obviously we're in a global pandemic. How has that affected you as a business owner, personally? Um, you know, what's life look like now? Well, the pandemic is scary. You know, like the pandemic isn't just happening to awake or to me, it's happening to all of us, you know? So there's, first and foremost, there's a, there's a form of fear that's there no matter what, you know? Uh, I feel like we've all felt some type of fear and anxiety over the last seven weeks. And if you haven't, then you're just in deep denial. I would be in deep denial to say like, everything is okay. Everything is not okay. Um, you know, what it has done is really push me to one, get really creative, you know, not just throwing the word creativity around, you know, but like talking about being in school and talking about, you know, being in college, like it's, it's reminding me of what it, what it was to be back in school and literally have, no budget, no resources, no assistant. You know, it's like, I got $20, I need to shoot a lookbook. How am I gonna do that? And how am I gonna make it look like a $20,000 lookbook? You know, so it's like, the way I used to be scrappy, and the thing is like, awake is scrappy. You know, and that's, you know, once again, we don't, we don't have a big investor. I don't have a partner. I, it's solely owned by me, by me alone. So the responsibilities are on me. Um, but like, it's like now, like now I have less. I already, I already was, I, I already didn't have enough. Like I, not the Supreme resources, you know what I mean? Like I had awake resources, which are good. They're not great. But like now it's like zero, you know, like, which, for, but I love that because it, it separates the real from the fake. You know what I'm saying? So like people that are scrambling at home and they don't know what to do and they own companies or they're, they're so-called creatives and they don't know what to do, you know, like not like now we get to see who's real, right? Now we get to see like, 
can you can you really step up? Can you really come up with with that new you know uh, marketing plan? Can you come up with that new lookbook idea? Can you can you really come up with these really cool graphic designs just sitting home alone? You know, so for me, it's it's really made me step up, which I like. I love a challenge. I love a challenge. I I never I never want to come into a fight having the advantage. I want to come always from the di- like from having the disadvantage because it, it it makes me it puts that pressure on me to want to step up. You know, like for me. It's like always like referencing 50 cent, you know, for like, it's always like the get rich or die trying moment, you know, like it's like, it's gonna, ha- it has to happen. Like we, like we're gonna have to put, you know, everything's on the table. Everything's on the table. Every time we do a drop, all the, all the bets, all the money's on the table, you know, like it's, it's like, and that's why, you know, I feel like people have gravitated towards the brand because they, they feel that authenticity and they, they feel the, the genuineness that's connected to the brand because, you know, it's like, I try to be as transparent as possible, you know, as even maybe sometimes that's to a fault, but I try to be as honest and transparent as possible with how I operate my business and with the people that I do business with. Awesome. So is it okay if we start doing questions? Let's go for it. Mindful of your time. Okay. So I'm going to do the first question is from Instagram. Um, and it's what's your number one advice for young people coming up in the industry? Just work hard. Just, you know, for me, it's like, you, you have to come into this industry with some type of work ethic. If you come in thinking that things are just gonna be handed to you, just because your, your work is good, or a few people said that your work is really great, or you think you're cute, or you got a good haircut, or you have a nice outfit, or what, like it doesn't, that'll get you through the door. Don't get me wrong, because I'm even fooled by pretty things, you know, like male and female, or however you identify, you know, like I can be blinded by beautiful things, right? Because I'm in, I'm in the business of making things look good. But then you, you actually have to perform, right? You're going to get that first assignment, you know, like Geneva, I need you to research, you know, uh, sportswear graphics, you know, uh, based on the New York Knicks from 1992. Now you have two days to get, get that for me. You know what I mean? And most people fall short. They can't, they don't, they don't know how to do that, you know, or they don't have the smarts to at least ask for help, you know? So my biggest, my, my biggest piece of advice for anyone in any industry, you know, you have to be really, really ready to work hard. That's all, you know, everything else will come to you, you know, like, and, and, and bring a big bag of humility wherever you go. Cause the truth is you don't know it. I, don't, I still don't know it all. You know, I'm, I'm constantly learning. Yeah, totally. I feel like ego is like the number one slip up in this industry. Um, so this is a fun question. What would you, would you want to try and travel to the future or to the past? Neither. <laughs> No, I, I'm really happy with being in the present. You know, I, I feel like, and I guess specifically with my age where I'm at right now, I'm going to be 42 this year. There's a lot of my friends are caught in the nostalgia of what New York used to be, right? And with the future, I'm okay with not future tripping. I don't want a future trip. You know, like I'm, I'm really happy to be in the now and the today and to be present with everyone in this room. And like the, like, I don't know, like the past, yeah, it would have been cool to be 16 in like 1982. But like, and anything prior to that was just really racist. Like, I'm good. You know what I mean? Like, I don't want to be at, like, at a sock hop in the early 60s. Like, that, the romanticism of that is really cool. But the reality is I wouldn't be allowed in a fucking sock hop, you know, or whatever it is. Like, so I'm actually really okay, like, with being in the now and making this as dope as possible. Yeah. That's beautiful. Okay, so we're going to start taking questions from the chat. Wayne wants to know, you know Wayne. How do you continue to challenge yourself, especially when you're already winning? Well, that winning, quote unquote, is pretty subjective. Like, I don't feel like I'm winning weight. <laughs> I love that he added the quote. I know, like winning, like winning, that's reality and perception. I might be winning on Instagram, but you look at my Chase Bank account and I'm not winning. Uh, because, you know, here's the thing, like, I, I'm... I'm not delusional, one, and two, I still know that there's a lot of work to do, you know, for example, like, and that work isn't always connected to monetary means and monetary gains. You know, for me, like, the work is having this kind of conversation. So after having this conversation, I consider this a win. You know, so I want to have more wins like this. It's not about the ASICs drop or the Reebok drop or working with Levi's or working with Rihanna or whatever it is. Like, that's cool. Those are, like, 
it was a nice like social um career notches but like they're not really wins because at the end of the day like what change am i really making you know so like i understand by my existence means that you guys can have this position one day and that's that's what i really want for me that'll be that'll be the win yeah okay how do you think the state of the industry looks like for content creators post pandemic Sorry, like what do you think is about to happen? What, what's gonna? How do content creators survive? I guess post pandemic. Y'all yeah, need to figure that out. <laughs> <laughs> Y'all need to figure that. Once again, is like that's what I keep talking about. Like separating, you know, part of my friends, like the bullshit from the real. You know what I'm saying? Like you can only fake your way for so long. So like this content creating, you know, like for for example, like the Kendall Jenner's or like the what do you like? You know, like, you're not really that interesting when you're sitting home all day doing nothing. Right. You know, so, like, how deep are you? You know, so, like, for me, like, this kind of, like, exploration on the out is really about the exploration on the in. Mm -hmm. It's all about, like, you got to like you gotta start figuring out who you are right now. And I feel like that's the best thing about having these, these seven weeks to sit at home where, like, I'm not distracted by the day-to-day, -day, where I got to run and meet with this person and be in my office by this certain time where I got a meeting with Geneva at 11 o'clock and da -da -da -da, you know, all the noise now is kind of like, it's kind of died down, you know? So like now I have to sit with me and now I got, you know, like, all right, what am I going to do now? Who am I about? Because I think what's really important, what we're all going to walk away from this is like purpose. Like, what is our purpose here? Yeah. What is your purpose here? What is my purpose here? What is my purpose as a brand? You know, because I've had bigger brands ask me too, like, what do, like, what do we do? I'm like, well, y'all need to figure it out because Awake has been awake since day one. So we don't need to switch it up. Not suddenly we have to be about giving back to the community or, you know, doing this, uh, you know, charity event for, you know, COVID masks. It's just like, we've been doing that. Yeah. You know, so like, y'all need to figure that out. Yeah, this question actually is kind of connected to that. So they're saying in response to your statement about healthy capitalist ecosystems, along with using t-shirts as a platform to educate, do you think that there are any ethical concerns such as profiting off of tragedy? Well, it depends on the, depends on the, what that is, you know? So for example, for me, I'm very hyper sensitive to that kind of stuff. You know, it's not like I would do a Bob Marley t-shirt and like, you know, say like free the world and then like, take all the profit for myself you know that's what i mean like if i'm going to do like a, a, a like a for example we did a covid pandemic sale and realistically i can't give all the profits away right, right? i would be out of business you know but i can't i can give i can i can give a a piece of the profits to certain charities that i feel need the support you know mm -hmm. so like that's what i mean about creating a healthy capitalist system where it's like i gain but at the same time i'm giving some of it away i can't give it all away you know and i think that's something that a lot of consumers your consumers don't really understand the realities behind that. Like in order to survive, you have to make some type of profit. Yeah. You know, and I, and I think like, what, you know, maybe if it's an extreme situation, like, yeah, like with the, unfortunately with the, with the young man that was killed in Georgia, you know, like I'm not going to put his face on a t-shirt and try to sell that. Like, that's just, I would, I wouldn't, how you, you know, like, how are you going to do that? But that's me. That doesn't mean that the next person won't try to do that. Yeah. You know, I don't know if that makes any sense. I don't know if that gives any clarity on that, on that question. Yeah. Do you think that the biggest breakthroughs happen when you run towards the pressure and discomfort? Yeah, you got to lean into it. The big, yeah, that's, you know, like if you, if you run from it, you're never going to see the real results. You're never going to really see like, I think us as humans, we have this natural instinct to want to live and survive right? We all have that oh shit button inside of us. You know, like when you're stuck in an elevator, you're not like, oh, this is cool. I'm going to sit here. You're like, yo, get me out of this elevator. You know what I mean? Like, and it's the same thing when you, when one day when you're in that professional setting and you're on deadline and you got to come up with those 10 ideas that you got to pitch, like it comes, it comes or it doesn't, you know, but once again, that's like either you're going to succeed or you're going to fail, but that, that's really within you. Um, what was the period of time after you went to SVA like? How did you transition into creating and working? Well, I interned the whole time I was at SVA. So I had a bunch of magazine internships. I internships for photographers that I admired, even if it was literally throwing out the trash in their studios or like Xeroxing invoices for them. I just wanted to be around creativity. 
I don't know if that as corny as that sounds. I just wanted to be in the realm of it, you know, like I interned at a hip hop record label, interned at magazines, uh, you know, and then that transitioned to me actually getting positioned at a magazine as a photo editor. Um, so I, I constantly interned, you know, like there was, there was, I, I would say there was a point in my life where I was working seven days a week, you know, like I had my, you know, I was, I was part-timing on the weekends on a, at a retail job. And then Monday through Thursday, I was in school. And then three days out of like, I, it would be like Monday, Wednesday, Friday, I was at a magazine, you know, just doing what I had to do or working for a photographer, you know? So I made sure that I was just always in the mix, whatever that means today, what, you know, however that kind of like, whatever the definition of that means today. I mean, it's pretty much the same thing, get an internship, go get involved, go work for a company, you know, that doesn't even mean it. Now, like, I feel like you have to pay interns. Like back in the day, you didn't get paid. You didn't get paid, you didn't get paid nothing. You were, you were expected to come and work, you know, 10, 12 hours and you just had to be grateful that you were in the room, you know? So the transition wasn't easy. That, that was a lot, that took time. And I had to drop out of school because I couldn't afford it. You know, the reality is that, you know, school was $26,000 and I didn't have the money. So I had to drop out and work retail. Which is so many of our experiences, you know, especially in this community. Um, so there's a couple questions that are all basically asking the same thing, which is what is the future of streetwear? What's, what is, what's going to happen post pandemic as if you're, <laughs> you're a genie, you know, exactly what's going to happen next. <laughs> but I just think everyone's in this place of uncertainty. So it's like, do you have a vision for, what the industry looks like post pandemic? I would say we don't have any control of what the industry is gonna look like. I say you guys have control over what the industry is gonna look like because you are who we, who we are designing for, right? So you, you're, you're gonna, you're, you guys, whether you know or not, are gonna dictate who survives and who doesn't, right? Who are, you, who are you really supporting? And that's what I'm talking about, really being pure about your message and, and being honest about your purpose and having a good I idea and what you're about as a brand, because that's all, that's all I can do. All I can do is just be me and, and put out the best work possible. So therefore you will support me and support the brand, right? So I, the truth is, I don't know what's gonna happen with streetwear, you know, cause I feel like streetwear at this point is almost like hip hop where it's, it's, it's been fragmented to so, like a lot of subcategories, you know, it's just say streetwear, streetwear is kind of like a huge umbrella and kind of blanket to throw over, you know, one part of the industry where like there's like, luxury streetwear, there's, you know, like emo streetwear, there's all this kind of like DIY streetwear, you know, it's, to me, it's, you know, like Virgil said something interesting in an interview back in January, we said streetwear is dead and everybody was like up in arms, like, what do you mean streetwear is dead? It's like, take into consideration up until 10 years ago, there wasn't a name for this category. The name was given because it, it needed to be commodified, right? Prior to this, it was called urban, which equates to black and brown. Right, so now it becomes streetwear because it needs to be it needs to be profited on, it needs to be sellable. So what is going to be the next name for this? You know, like that's all. Once like once those higher ups decide that all right, this is we can't make any more money off of streetwear, it will become something else. So I, I can't, I really am not concerned in in a way about what streetwear is going to become. You know, it's just like I know what I do best. I I make awake. You know, I do awake. You know, but that's it. Yeah. Okay, just two more and then we're going to be done. So it says, um, Mitzen says, the homepage of Awake currently says it's relaunching soon. What can we expect from Awake um, next? The best. You're going to go next Friday. All you guys are going to buy a t-shirt. Uh, <laughs> thank you all so much for keeping me in business. Uh, right, it's, it's going to be the same what we've been doing. You know, I, I honestly really do believe that we do the best work out there. I have to believe that, you know, I really believe that we're creating our own lane, we're creating our own path. And, you know, I love that, for example, like the give back now streetwear is kind of, it's a normal part of the dialogue. It's not so like, oh, I can't believe that you're gonna do this, you know, um, donation to Charity X. Like it's just, it's just, it's part of, it's part of the streetwear landscape now. So just, you know, I, I hope that you guys just like what we do. Okay, last question. Um, where do you, where else, besides pushing social responsibility with Awake, where else do you look for for inspiration for your work? Music, art, um, friends, my peers, my, you know, my fellow artist friends that make work too, you know. Um, 
other who I think in my mind are competitive brands, you know, like, cause I'm super competitive. Like I want to be the best. So I look at what they do and I'm like, Oh, I'm going to, I'm going to top that. You know, like I, that I once again, but that's a New Yorker in me, you know, like I feel like we're the best, we're the best in the world. Being New Yorkers is we're the shit, you know? So there's no way that anybody can really compete with us globally. And I've been around the world and I will say we are the best. <laughs> um, I agree with that. So um, thank you so much. Uh, are you looking for interns? Yes. Nice. Okay. Yes. So We'll share your email information, but y'all you, you have his IG on our information, but we will give you uh, an email. Although no promises that Angela will email you back because he sometimes doesn't email us back. <laughs> that sounds like shade. And <laughs> I, will, I will embrace that and accept it. <laughs> Listen, we're all doing our best in a global crisis. Cool. Thank you for right, your time. Be Please be safe out there. Please be safe. Yeah. Yeah. It's crazy yeah. time right now, right? So as, as young as young adults, you know, as young adults of color, it's it just be really conscious, be really safe of your spaces. And I cannot stress that more now than ever. Like, just be really careful out there, all right? I haven't met y'all, but I love y'all. And thank you so much for hearing this old man for 30 minutes. And hopefully you got something out of it. Um, and yeah, hit me up if you want to intern from me. But thank you. Yay. Um, and then Ida, can you add the survey so that folks can do the survey? But that's it. Thank you so, so much. We appreciate you. You're the best, literally. Peace, y'all. Have a good day. Thank you, Angelo. Thank you, Ida. Appreciate you. Okay, so Ida's going to add the link in the chat. Please, please, please do the survey. So don't leave until she puts it in there. I'm glad y'all enjoyed that. Thank you so much for showing up and for asking such good questions. The link is in there now. Thank you and we'll see you next week. <laughs>